Welcome to Cinema Bites on CCP TV, the two time Emmy nominated educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. I'm your host, Dr. Amy Lewis. I'm an assistant professor of English who teaches film here at the college. Cinema Bites reviews issues and topics within classic and contemporary films. This episode examines the movie musical. Although it is often thought of as the lily white, old fashioned art form your grandmother loves, this episode takes a closer look at the movie musical's attempts uh, to be more inclusive and representative. Sometimes it was ahead of its time. Sometimes it thwarted its own efforts with problematic casting decisions and representations. But for all of its missteps, the movie musical has been one of the most progressive genres when it comes to race and representation. And today we're going to examine the highs and the lows of the movie musical and its attempts to make the world look beyond a white dominated worldview. While all of the films we're going to explore today had earlier incarnations as Broadway musicals, what I find significant about the translation of these films to screen is the level of scrutiny applied to the art form. Theater has always been ahead of the curve socially because of its smaller audience and its more artistic representation, which allows it to be more progressive in subject matter and approach. Movies, however, reach a broader audience and thus have higher expectations to reach societal norms and conform to the hegemony. So while a lot of these films were made decades after their theatrical predecessors, they often had to contend with stronger scrutiny, which sometimes affected how the pieces were executed. Nevertheless, each made some strides in broadening the audience's view of what the real world looked and sounded like. For this reason, I find they're worthy of a closer look. So let's begin. We begin our discussion with James Whale's 1936 version of Oscar Hammerstein's Showboat. Set from the late 1880s to the 1920s, the film follows the lives of those living, working, and performing on a riverboat on the Mississippi River. While none of that may seem particularly envelope pushing, it is worth noting that Showboat provided a sympathetic view of post-slavery blacks in the South and their trials and tribulations as well as a critical eye toward racial classification laws, such as the one drop rule that claimed anyone with even the slightest bit of black ancestry could legally be discriminated against. Most importantly, Showboat did this while having actual black people play the black roles. That may not sound very revolutionary now, but considering blackface was still being done at this time, most notably in The Jazz Singer just nine years earlier, Showboat was ahead of its time in order to be more realistic in its portrayal of the sadness and quiet despair running through black America like the Mississippi River through the Deep South. Perhaps no scene shows this better than Paul Robeson's powerful rendition of Old Man River, which still remains the seminal performance of the song. Let's watch. Ask Miss Julie what she thinks. Ask old River what he thinks. He knows all about them boys. He knows all about everything. There's an old man called the Mississippi. That's the old man that I'd like to be. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? Old Man River, that old man river, he must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling. But old man river, he just keeps rolling along. You and me, we sweat and strain, body all aching and racked with pain. Tote that butt, lift that veil, you get a little drunk and your land's in. I get weary and sick of trying 
I'm tired of living and scared of dying, but Let me go away from the white man boss. Show me that stream called the River Jordan. That's the old stream that I long to cross. Old Man River, the Old Man River, he must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling. Actual black actors in this scene brings the appropriate gravitas to the moment. These are real people experiencing actual pain, not minstrels putting on a skit. By divorcing itself of the broad and insensitive characterizations tied to blackface when portraying its actual black characters, Showboat allows Robeson's powerful vocals to shine unfiltered. Joe sings the song of so many nameless, faceless, black and mixed race people who have been swept aside by a force as seemingly unstoppable as the Mississippi River. And as a result, mainstream white America got a look at those left by the wayside almost two decades before the civil rights movement would even begin. Sadly, the film did decide to include a blackface number in one of its stage performance scenes. Despite this song not even appearing in the stage play, it was included on screen as one of Magnolia's performances on the ship. It undercuts an otherwise very progressive approach to race relations in the film and is impossible to forgive. Fortunately, Robeson's powerful performance is the image that remains with the viewers at the end of the film, helping to bury the serious misstep taken by the film's choice to use blackface here. While Showboat made America listen to the tribulations people of color faced, it did not exactly open the floodgates of roles for minorities on film. Indeed, in the 1940s, if your last name wasn't Garland, Rooney, or Crosby, it was highly unlikely you'd be taking a very active role in the movie musical. However, the 1950s and 60s saw some more regular attempts at diversifying musical theater offerings. Perhaps no film explored the issue of race on film as openly and powerfully as Joshua Logan's 1958 film production of Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical masterpiece, South Pacific. Whereas Showboat tackled issues of race as a secondary story and in a grand metaphorical moment, South Pacific hits prejudice head on and as a central theme. 
Set on a South Pacific island during World War II, South Pacific features issues of race and prejudice prominently in the stories of two of its main characters. Nellie Forbush falls in love with dashing Frenchman Emile de Beck, and all seems to be going perfectly until she is blindsided by the discovery he is the father of two mixed-race Asian children. Only when she fears Emile has been killed can she see the children as equal to others who may have suffered a devastating loss, and she comes to love them before being happily reunited with Emile. While Nellie and Emile's story is touching and doesn't shy away from the issue of racial prejudice, the most daring exploration of racism in the film comes from the story of Lieutenant Joseph Cable and his Asian love, Liat. Beguiled by Liat, Joseph comes crashing down to earth when he remembers his family's own prejudice and realizes a future with her is simply not possible. The film's most profound moment comes as Joe laments his lost love and Emile grapples with Nellie's rejection of his children. It's in this moment that Joe proclaims that racism is not something someone is born with, but rather something that someone is carefully taught. Let's take a look. I do not believe it is born in you. I do not believe it. It's not born in you. It happens after you're born. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. The song is the film's most controversial and a perfect example of Rodgers and Hammerstein's masterful writing. Its strong, blunt lyrics are belied by a jaunty, merry melody revealing how racism can be passed down in such innocent, seemingly harmless ways until one loses sight of how he or she came to hold those feelings in the first place. Just four years after the dawn of the civil rights movement, this number was hitting America at a time when racial acceptance was anything but the norm. That said, I would be remiss if I didn't point out a very problematic element of the piece. The casting of Juanita Hill, a black actress, as an Asian character. Certainly, this is an issue in a film looking to educate its audience on the value of a particular culture, and today's stage productions do not make this same error. But if anything makes up for this egregious casting, it is the exposure American audiences got to the plight of those often overlooked in the narrative of World War II, and an unflinching look at how racism can create barriers and misery between people. This does not erase the problem, of course, but it perhaps helps offset it but a little bit. A few years after South Pacific, the 1960s saw some more promising offerings. They were by no means in the majority, but pieces like Henry Coster's film production of Rodgers and Hammerstein's The Flower Drum Song in 1961 offered some visibility for other cultures. While once again there were some problematic elements, namely Juanita Hill once again being cast as an Asian, and some stereotypical representations, and Asian ethnicities being treated as interchangeable with Japanese and Korean actors playing Chinese characters, the film did nevertheless feature an almost entirely Asian cast. This was something quite unheard of for a mainstream Hollywood release, particularly in a year when Mickey Rooney played an Asian character in arguably one of the most offensive film portrayals of all time in Breakfast at Tiffany's. However, it was another production that year, Robert Wise's and Jerome Robbins's film production of Arthur Lorenz, Leonard Bernstein's, and Stephen Sondheim's West Side Story that made the biggest splash. 
Winning 10 of the 12 Academy Awards for which it was nominated, most notably Best Picture, the film was undoubtedly a hit, and it remains a beloved classic to this day. West Side Story took the much-known tale of Romeo and Juliet and transported it to New York City in the summer of 1957. No longer did the conflict of the story take place between two rival families. This time, the tension builds between two gangs, the White Jets and the Puerto Rican Sharks. As with South Pacific a few years earlier, racism is at the forefront in West Side Story, and the audience has shown how, exactly, America appears to those who don't fit its traditional mold. As the Puerto Rican community faces discrimination at every turn, it grows increasingly disillusioned with the American dream, culminating in the famous number, America. Let's take a look. In America. Okay. Okay. Buying on credit is so nice. One look at us and they charge twice. I have my own washing machine. What will you have though to keep clean? <laughs> Skyscrapers bloom in America. Had a lot zoom in America. Industry boom in America. Twelve in a room in America. <laughs> New housing with more space. Lots of doors slamming in our face. I'll get a terrorist apartment. Better get rid of your accent. Life can be bright in America. If you can fight in America. Life is all right in America. If you're all white in America. <laughs>
Though the scene is comedic and high energy, the message is loud and clear. America does not deliver the promise of its dream to all who seek it. As the men point out the social and economic barriers that limit their every attempt to fit in and move up, white America sits through an uncomfortable but brutally honest account of what those who do not look like us must endure. As a result, the number is both exhilarating and excoriating, leaving an indelible mark on the viewer. Again, though, I must point out that West Side Story is not without its flaws. Very notably, two of the lead Latino characters, Maria and Bernardo, are played by non-Latino actors. Natalie Wood, who played Maria, was of white Eastern European descent, and George Chakiris, who played Bernardo, was of Greek descent. While Natalie Wood did not don brown face, Chakiris and even Rita Moreno, who actually was Puerto Rican, were spray painted brown to look more Puerto Rican. This is upsetting and certainly not to be glossed over. However, if anything can somewhat offset this problem, the film did force audiences to face the terrible and tragic repercussions of racism, and it gave Latino actors one of only two Academy Awards they've ever won for acting for Rita Marino's portrayal of Anita. So, though far from perfect, the film did, in its own flawed way, help promote greater understanding and appreciation of Latinos and their story in the U.S. It just would have been nicer had more Latinos been able to take part in the telling of this story. Up until this point, the movie musicals I've discussed have looked at the sadder or more challenging elements of race on film. But Sidney Lumet's 1978 film production of The Wiz, a Broadway musical written by Charlie Smalls, Luther Vandross, William F. Brown, and several others, is a twist on The Wizard of Oz told gleefully and touchingly through a black lens. Dorothy and Friends are all black in this version of the classic tale, and Kansas is swapped for Harlem. The music, actors, and setting are all more relevant to black culture, and the resulting film is a celebration with black America powerfully at the forefront. While it was not necessarily uncommon to see black actors on screen in the 1970s, much of the film representation for black actors at the time was concentrated to black exploitation films like Shaft, which, though popular, were often violent and hypersexualized. The Wiz was a family-friendly fair that boasted a cast of black Hollywood and Motown A-listers, such as Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, and Nipsey Russell. Dorothy makes her coming-of-age journey through an urbanized Oz, and the characters are not relegated to watching life pass them by like an unstoppable river. Now they are easing on down the road and claiming their own destiny. Here's a clip. were a transitional time for the movie musical. 
While there were some more traditional offerings of Broadway musicals adapted for the screen, such as 1982's Annie and 1985's A Chorus Line, most productions were either star vehicles like 1980's The Jazz Singer and 1983's Yentl, or ill-conceived projects like 1980's Disastrous Popeye. Some rock and pop stars like David Bowie and Prince starred in films with music in them, but as a whole, the film musical in its purest form, with song driving the narrative, was pretty dormant during this decade. However, in the 1990s, the musical had a reawakening, and Alan Parker's 1996 film production of Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Evita reignited America's love affair with the art form. Set in the 1950s, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Evita explores the meteoric rise and much too early death of Eva Perón, the wife of the Argentinian president. The film portrays the story of a polarizing figure in Argentinian culture, departing from American-centric stories traditionally covered in musicals. The audience learns of a period in Argentina's history and the actions of one of its most public and sometimes controversial figures. In this scene, Che, the narrator of the story, details Evita's charitable work and possible plundering of the country's treasury. Let's watch. The money kept rolling in from every side. out and they reach wide Now you may feel it should have been a voluntary cause But that's not the point, my friends When the money keeps rolling in You don't ask how Think of all the people guaranteed a good time now Never scold the hungry to her Open up the doors Never been a family The foundation never for On your landlord's house, take the family on vacation. Eva and her blessed find that can make your dreams come true. Here's all you have to do, my friends. Write your name and your dream on a car, on a pad, on a ticket. Throw it high in the air and shoot our lady picket. She will change your way of life for a week or even two. Name me anyone who cares as much as Eva Perot. To the poor, to the weak, to the destitute of all complexions. Now cynics claim a little of the cash has gone astray. But that's not the point, my friends. When the money keeps rolling out, you don't keep books. You can tell your town well by the happy, grateful looks. Accountants only slow things down, figures get in the way. Never been a lady loved as much as ever. The scene 
Jane gives audiences a great deal of detail in a short span of time, and we quickly learn a lot about the dichotomous nature of Evita's role in the country's history. But once again, Hollywood couldn't help itself, casting white actors, namely Madonna and Jonathan Price, in two of the largest Latino roles. This is particularly disappointing given this was taking place in the 90s, a time when Latino culture was more popular than ever with the explosion of Jennifer Lopez, Ricky Martin, and Mark Anthony on the music scene. While West Side Story was guilty of also whitewashing its casting, it was made in the 1960s. By the 1990s, Hollywood could have afforded to be a little bolder in its choices. Spanish, but not Argentinian actor Antonio Banderas does take a prominent role in the film as well, which is at least almost a step in the right direction, but one can't help but feel the film took a cowardly approach in its casting overall. That said, at least Evita introduces audiences to the history of a country not often covered in American history books, and offers at least a couple of Latino actors, most notably Banderas and Olga Merides, some screen time. It could have done more, though. The 90s may have disappointed with its flawed attempts at inclusivity in on-screen musicals, but films since the year 2000 have done a much better job. There's some colorblind casting, such as in 2002's Chicago and 2014's Annie, and some of the more diverse 1990s musicals have been adapted to the screen, like in 2005's Rent. But the most notable efforts have been those that have confronted race head-on. 2007's Hairspray, set in Baltimore during the civil rights era, did an excellent job of creating a visceral yet enjoyable reaction for audiences to the injustices plaguing America in its time of social unrest and disparate fortunes between its black and white citizens. But it was Bill Condon's 2006 production of Dreamgirls, with its critical and box office success, that made the largest impact. Set in the 1960s and 70s in the Detroit music scene, Dreamgirls tells the tale of a girl group subject to the racism and sexism of the music industry. Effie, a talented singer, is pushed aside for her thinner and more traditionally marketable band member and ends up in a life of poverty. Meanwhile, other black artists are either robbed of their music so white acts can put out more mainstream versions while the original black versions get buried into obscurity, or they're asked to alter their sounds in ways that will better register with white audiences. The film pulls no punches in detailing the racism of the record industry, and no she's seen shows this more than the one in which we see Jimmy and the Dreamettes' rising hit Cadillac Car get stymied in ascent as the song is poached and repackaged to become a big hit for the white artists Dave and the Sweethearts. Take a look. Get a hold of you here. It's a different sound for the Thunder Man, and I think you're gonna enjoy it. Got me a Cadillac. Cadillac, Cadillac. Oh my god, the rap is alive! We are the radio party! What's happening? Black station, the signal's too weak. Let's turn this boat around, hurry up! CC, fix it, what you waiting for? and number 98 on the pop chart.
Dave and the Sweethearts with their marvelous new recording Cadillac car. Dream Girls is the promise of what American movie musicals can be. It tells the story of the country's injustices, yet it also takes an empowered stance in fighting them. Effie and the girls come together and take control of their destinies, conquering those who would stand in their way. Their fight is not easy, and we would not want it to be, as this would sanitize an ugly part of the country's history, and possibly its present. But these women are not victims. As Effie says herself, she's gonna win, and we believe her. Most refreshingly, Dream Girls, though directed by a white man, is largely driven by its outstanding black cast. We would not be talking about this film nearly as much as we do today had it not been for Beyonce's star power and Jennifer Hudson's Oscar-winning performance. Dream Girls and the other movie musicals of the 2000s have shown us there is room for everyone in the movie musical landscape. Roles are still dominated by whites, but room is being made for other races and ethnicities, creating a more varied and interesting milieu through which our songs and dances take place. Hollywood is becoming less hesitant and to produce pieces with minority casts, and we are thankfully saying goodbye to whitewashing and black and brown face. Though other genres are still seeing a healthy dose of white actors cast in roles intended for people of color so as not to frighten away more timid mainstream audiences, the movie musical, despite its reputation for being a lily-white, old-fashioned art form, is leading the way for more inclusive, progressive representation. And for that, it can be very proud of itself. Well, that's all the time we have for today. You've been watching Cinema Bites on CCP-TV, the educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. Thank you for joining us, and keep an eye out for the next big film debate. See you next time.